Welcome to Serial Bookworms, where we are reading through Mother of Learning a few chapters at a time and talking about them every other week. Feel free to participate, speculate, and ask questions. All I ask is you please keep the topic to our current knowledge and chapters if you have read ahead on the story. Where we last left off, Zorian and the Aranea have hatched a plan to massively disrupt the invasion with the intent of forcing the third time traveler they think is around out of hiding. To that end, Zorian has been spreading rumors of the Cult of the Dragon summoning a primordial, and the matriarch, Spear of Resolve, has informed Zack that they are aware of the time loop. Zack doesn't know that Zorian is in the time loop because of this little telephone game with the Aranea, but will he stay anonymous with the events being so, so very messed up? We start immediately where we left off the last chapter. Spear of Resolve talks to Z about Zack's reaction to learning he isn't alone. Zack also was told there is a third one who mind wipe him, which understandably does nothing to improve Zack's mood. The Matriarch is confident in their plans to bait out the third time traveler for an ambush, but Zorian isn't as assured their preparations will overwhelm a single mage who has had potentially years or even decades of experience. The Aranea give him a list of places to strike, him being Zack, of course. <laughs> he is quite a bit more combat skilled than Zorian. And Zack is pleased to have something he can reach out and destroy with a fireball. Far less suspicious than Zorian, who is constantly thinking about people's motivations and gathering as much knowledge as he can turn up. Zack seems to be a bit more of a straight shooter kind of person. During a lull in their discussion between the Matriarch and Zorian, uh, Spear of Resolve brings up that Aranea scatter small memory packets in the minds of the males. If the packets are broken up small enough, one wouldn't even be able to make sense of them without a key. Did the Aranea develop secret sharing cryptography? Are we gonna have spiders with advanced symmetric asymmetric keys? Hold on, I I'm now imagining a future where we got some infosec spiders in like a little office space sitting in a room watching computer logs and programming. <laughs> Zorian is confused as to why she was mentioning this RNA skill, and she elaborates that the males are far smaller and quite fearful. When an RNA settlement is destroyed, many males will survive because of the scattering. Memory packets left in them is a strategy RNA webs do to leave messages from beyond the grave. This doesn't assuage Zorian's concern, as it seems like she's not sharing something important with him, or that she is far less confident in their project success than she is letting on. Next time he scuttles by for lessons with novelty, he'll pass the mind packet key on to Zorian. Time passes and Zorian is amusing himself with mind magic training while waiting for Kale to arrive on the train platform. He tries to sit in the back of their mind and process their experiences without trying to control them. It is slow progress as their perspectives of the world is just so alien to him, but any progress is still good. After around 50 or so winged victims with a vague understanding of the pigeon's feelings and slightly influencing them. And it's that second skill he tries to hone, dampening the pigeon's innate fear and induce it to come up close to him. Kale's train arrives and the two head back to Amaya's. As with Zorian bringing Kiriel, he is once again sharing a roof. Back at the house, Amaya is playing host to many of our characters. Pyvan is regaling people with the dungeon exploration and fighting the pack of trolls the invaders directed. Ilsa is taking more of a dim view on further dungeon excursions and cautions Tyvan while flat out forbidding Zorian. 
Zorian also catches a stray called shot from Tyvin when she laments about probably not surviving if Zorian had not been with them. Something she doesn't. Whenever Zorian doesn't take action to make sure she survives visiting the dungeon at the start of a loop. Hmm. I don't think this is going to be the last time we have a bit of bridge horror from unsuspecting people's comments, which take on a different tone with our knowledge and understanding of events as they unfold within the time loop. The subject of the Aranea comes up, and Zorian informs the people present how he's not in danger from them. It would be like a human deciding to fight a dragon to get some food. He dangles meeting Seeker of Novelty in front of Kyriel, and she cannot help but jump at the chance. As the evening winds down and people leave, Zorian is doing some tinkering in his room when Kale shows up. And just to make the loop a bit more complex, he proceeds to also bring Kale up to speed with the time loop and introduce a further pseudo time loop into the powder keg that is the current time loop. The next day, we get a day in the life of Zorian, Ilsa's apprentice, namely being the teacher's assistant and having to review the homework of his classmates. What he thought would be easy skimming due to his knowledge from looping has become a frustrating time sink, as something about the events from the loop's disruption have gotten Ilsa to give out different homework. So now he actually does have to read through everyone's answers and actually grade them. From dealing with his childhood friend Benesek trying to wheedle uh, free homework from Zorian, instead of failing to turn in assignments for the third time, to other classmates trying to convince him to accept late work against Ilsa's standing policies, Zorian is lamenting his existence as an intern. It is a little awkward interacting with Akoja as with his empathy better under his control, he has been able to sense that she actually has a crush on him, which paints all the past interactions with her in a bit of a different light. Unfortunately, she is carrying the torch solo as Zorian doesn't really feel the same towards her. After bringing everything to Ilsa, she has a chat with him about his mind magic. She has been making inquiries to confirm some of what he claimed about it, and we get some interesting information to help explain why Zorian has had such a difficult time finding anything in the library or generally human sources regarding empathy. The Aranea are all born telekinetic, so they naturally refine the skill. How humans, however, are rarely empathic, and thus often isolated and more likely to dismiss it. Plus, it seems a lot of the humans have been making a distinction and separation between empathy and mind magic, which would further hamper study and research into developing uh, control over empathy and other mind magic related skills. It also turns out Ilsa has had a request for a mind magic expert to train with from one of the students. None of the teachers are interested in having a student rifle around their mind, but apparently the student in question is quite politically entrenched, so outright refusal is difficult to field. Zorian is given the opportunity to stand in as the school's mind magic tutor for them, if he wants. After mulling over the risks, like, say, the student actually being better than him and they're able to go deep into his mind and learn about the time loop or other sensitive matters, it is quite improbable and he does have the skills to detect such a mental intrusion if they're trying to do something so invasive. And it turns out our mysterious student is none other than Tinami Ayo the spider-loving, suspicious person that Zorian chatted up so many loops ago at a party Zack hosted for the summer festival. He recalls he did think about introducing her to the Aranea sometime, 
And he's already having his sister meet the Aranea. Hmm. Looks like Zorian is going to have a little bit of fun this loop. Later, Zorian introduces himself to Tinami, and they get down to thinking at each other very hard. Though it seems Zorian is missing a skill for his telepathy. The spell-based telepathy that Tinami uses establishes a two-way link, but Zorian's way of connecting to a mind is only one way. He realizes, with Aranea all being telepathic, needing a two-way link for the other person to think back is unnecessary. He makes a note to find a solution to bridge this gap. They conclude the lesson with Zorian offering to introduce Tinami to his teacher, Seeker of Novelty, one of the legendary Aranea. An indeterminate time later, we see Zorian at the temple he had visited at the request of the Aranea, back when he was looking into the divination blockout after the summer solstice. We get some descriptions of primordials while he waits for the priest to get around to him. We have Kynth, the Locust Lord, whose brawn carapace was immune to all but divine weaponry, and capable of releasing clouds of countryside scouring insects from his body. Gates, a ball of multicolored bird wings. Just bird, it, it's just bird wings. It's literally just a sphere of bird wings. But it goes around creating storms and tornadoes, apparently sucking matter into the sphere where it just disappears. Who's Ketchko, some kind of porcupine crocodile bear made of obsidian that poisons anyone that gets the faintest scratch from one of his protrusions which it could also fire like arrows. The priest Batak interrupts Zorian's doom scrolling, so he disgorges the invasion details to also get church pressure to complicate the invader plans. When he's done detailing everything and handing over the documents Zorian prepared with Aranea Information Network Assistance, he does muse about why people would need to do all of this just to summon a primordial. Batak, switching to priest instructor mode, prompts Zorian for what he knows about primordials. Judging by Batak's exasperation at Zorian's description of uh, powerful spirits from ancient times like fey or elementals, but older, weirder, and more dangerous. It is not a good answer. The priest proceeds to drop a thick stack of lore on us. In this essay, I will detail what spirits are and why primordials cannot be one. <laughs> Outsider spirits are things like demons and angels, entities that only exist in the material world briefly when summoned. Native spirits are thought to have been outsider spirits at one point, but have adapted to the material world. What keeps them in common with outsider spirits is they still don't really have bodies. They're disembodied souls that need a vessel of some kind. Cutting the dressing down, spirits are just soul entities. Period. Arguably, a lich is just as much a spirit, as they are an existence of just a soul which can be inside some kind of body. Vessel. Reeling all of this back to primordials, they actually have bodies, no matter how strange and weird they are. So they're more like a magical creature, like a dragon, than that of a spirit, who is strange because they can twist their ectoplasm into weird forms. Primordials just kind of be like that. This, of course, brings a question to mind. Then how are the invaders summoning a primordial? if it's just a magical creature in the material world. Batak enlightens us that it's merely a misunderstanding of the underlying situation. Primordials are bound, locked away and forced into a toper. They can be set loose. Although another question then comes up, if there's so much trouble, it seems like it'd be better if a primordial was just outright killed rather than sealed away. 
plague beetle, black hole bird that Zorian studied on the frescoes. Ah, those kind of seem like entities you don't want to buy a house next to. Unfortunately, it seems primordials die messily. So terribly that even when the gods were still around and they did manage to kill one, its death throes corrupted areas so deeply and it was so difficult to purify that the gods instead resorted to sealing them away in the far corners of the earth. For understandable reasons, the specifics on where they're sealed are vague. Gee, I wonder why. So anyway, about this cult. <laughs> we jump later to Zorian bringing Kiriel to meet Novelty. He also used the opportunity to get some less than legal spells off Tenemi. Visibility is finally his. But once he actually practices it. And he gets to cash his check twice, as Novelty thinks he's doing her a favor for bringing a human to meet the Aranea. Favors from both ends of the deal. It's all coming up Zori in this loop, baby. Unfortunately, after Kiriel and Novelty work through a clash of cultures, Novelty tries to approach and give a hug, to which Kiriel immediately dopes out of the situation. Um, apparently, a dog-sized spider is not considered cute by the average human. <laughs> we then smash cut to Tenemi's visit, and we have a completely different situation. You can practically read the stars in Tenemi's eyes, and she immediately starts lavishing novelty with praise. Novelty's ego grows three sizes that day, and the two kick Zorian out so they can have a discussion on their own. The matriarch makes an appearance once Zorian is far enough away. It turns out they were also using it as an opportunity to check Tenemi's mind for whether she is or has met someone who could be the third looper. While Zorian grouses about potentially being pulled in for questioning after visiting the church, Spear of Resolve indicates that their web has been nudging and redirecting inquiries towards the web. It seems she has also decided to make use of the time loop and use it as a test run for the Aranea coming out publicly to Sayoria and establish a more official working relationship. So far, it's been a bit mixed, leaning positive. On one hand, introducing yourself with, by the way, you're about to be attacked, doesn't come off very well. On the other, there's a bit of profit to be found in sapient magical creatures. And Spear of Resolve will trust humans greed more than their compassion. A surprisingly mercantile outlook from a society that we haven't really seen have currency, but can't say it's very wrong as far as we understand human society in this world. Not exactly looking at a post-scarcity magictopia. The days slip by and Zorian is extremely busy. One of the major items he works on creating items for is the trap for the third time traveler. He decides on a multi-stage trap in the RNA and settlement that they'll bait him into. He figures it's best to keep things simple. First, it will liquefy the stone briefly. This will hopefully trap most of their body. Second part will be a dimensional lock to prevent teleporting out. And finally, smoke with a whole bunch of sedatives. Very powerful, very powerful sedatives. Hail helped. And that guy knows his way around the alchemy cauldron, I'll tell you what. He also creates various items to help the Aranea in combat. Shield spells on discs that they can strap to their body, vials of alchemy mixtures. Spear of Resolve even manages to hire a couple mercenary mage companies for the ambush. In an effort to reduce the invader's ability to find out about all these preparations, they also go out of their way to hunt down the cephalic rats. Capturing one and using his divination skills, Zorini is able to help the RNA locate four major cephalic rat swarms and wipe them out. Soon, the day of the festival looms, and Zorian is waiting for his partner to arrive. It's Akoja. 
an interesting mirror from the start of this whole situation where she was his date. Except last time it was because Ilsa directed her to at bring Zorian to the festival dance. Zorian asked her out himself. I feel like this is a very interesting way to show Zorian's maturity and growth. He's no longer, or at least less so, the cynical, bitter introvert like he was subjectively two years ago. He has a better understanding of himself, better control of his emotions, and, well, it's a bit ironic, but more empathy for his fellow classmates. Kale strikes up a conversation with Zorian with a gift and a request. With the powerful Lich on the invaders being a difficult foe to face, he gives Zorian a silver disc, sort of looking like a particularly large coin. Because Liches are soul entities, they are vulnerable to being trapped, so often they do have safety measures to snap back to their phylactery rather than be captured. If Zorian can touch the Lich with the coin, it should sever the link between the body it's in and snap the soul back to its phylactery. Inhabiting a new body can take a couple days, which is more than enough for their purposes on the summer solstice. However, it will be up to Zorian to figure out how to touch the coin to the Lich. Throwing it will be difficult, as it is a small object, and mages are not known for just letting things hit them. Kale's request, however, is to get in on the time loop, or at least the knowledge transfer part. Kale wants to give Zorian his alchemy notes so that he can constantly experiment and push forward. He gives Zorian a notebook packed tightly with notes, and he spends the rest of his waiting time memorizing it, making his own notes as Kale is leagues better than him in the field of alchemy. We jump to the school dance, and Ekoja is far less of a hassle when it isn't Ilsa directing her to bring Zorian as a plus one. Meanwhile, Zorian has been monitoring Sayoria with his telepathic relays, the RNA Helton distribute throughout. The plan already has a couple wins. The artillery barrage doesn't happen due to the mages being ambushed. With the wording scheme changed up, the invaders can't just teleport in and start causing problems. The tunnels from the dungeon that they come up from were likewise contested by the still somewhat half-hearted efforts by the Sayorian leadership, as they figured the RNA were simply exaggerating how big of a deal the invasion was. This makes when the doors in the dance hall bust down an even bigger surprise to Zorian, as we see some elite swagger in. A familiar lich, a woman clad in an all-black uniform, uh, pretty pale, almost like... No, no, she's, she's definitely going to be a vampire. And the third dastardly amigo is a person in blood-red robes, which conceal him from head to toe. His face isn't even visible, as it seems there's some kind of magic effect creating a patch of darkness where his face would be in the open cowl, obscuring him completely. And it is the red robe who seems to be looking amongst the students and immediately points out Zack. Chaos breaks out. Despite the hall filled with students and faculty, our three plucky antagonists are no pushovers. The Lich gets its armor blasted off, and the crown is wearing is flung across the room with a coronated barrage by some black bolts thrown by Zack, yet its metallic bones don't even look scuffed. The woman is confirmed to be a vampire, or some variant of undead at least, as she is literally disarmed with barely a pause to the inconvenience, simply drawing a dagger with her still attached arm and continuing to murder. Red Robe, though, is the least impressive, as the students do manage to bloody him a bit, but he is still capable enough of taking on masses of newbie mages and the occasional faculty person who tries to defend them. Zorian has been hanging back, 
as this is just an information gathering job, he would not be much help in a battle. Unfortunately, Akosia got the attention of the vampire woman. Zorian immediately intervenes, disrupting her charge with an explosive cube and following up with an incinerating beam with all the mana he can muster. Thankfully, she is dazed enough from the cube that Zorian can keep it on her long enough for the flames to reduce her to ashes. Oh boy, out of the pot and into the frying pan, because this immediately draws the attention of the Lich to Zorian. We get a bit of a comical moment with Akosia bug-eyed and speechless at Zorian saving her, or perhaps simply his display of combat prowess. The Lich is looking back and forth between the Ashes and Zorian. And the Lich seems to have decided something, as he immediately no-sells Zack with a jagged red lightning bolt. Perhaps a somewhat familiar spell, as Zorian has been ended by something quite similar in loops in the past. Red Robe grouses about Zack almost dying, and they need him alive, and the Lich makes clear that Red Robe means nothing to him. It seems Red Robe might be more of an ally of convenience than actually part of the invasion force. Ripping the information of the Aranea out of Zack's mind, Red Robe teleports out after muttering about them. With everything gone to a standstill, the Lich once again turns to Zorian. Ooh, 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 time for a villain monologue? Ooh, this is our first, so it deserves due credit. I hated her, you know, the Lich said conversationally, pointing at the smoking remains of the vampire girl. She thought she was so much better than little old Kutak Ishel. I was a relic, she said. Or she was the next generation of undead, or some bills like that. Now look at her. Killed by a precocious student with a simple fire spell. Still, while I find the situation amusing, I can't exactly let you get away with it, you know? She was kind of important, as much as it rankles me. And I can't just go back home and say, Remember that Zotan heir you told me to take care of? Oh, I kind of lost her. The head of the house will, at the very least, want your head for this, if not your soul. Yep. The Lich is Quitakishul, the legendary general from the Necromancer's War. Zorian really needs to pick his enemies better. You're supposed to work up to fighting the ancient liches of legendary power and skill. Zorian reaches really far into his bag of tricks to pull out his only option, a bribe. He takes out the silver disc that Kale made for him and asks if the lich could be convinced he couldn't catch the vampire woman slayer. He tosses the coin. It would be so easy for the Lich to knock it aside or put up a shield. A bony hand raises up and grasps the coin. The skeleton seems to pause for a moment and then collapses unresponsive. While everyone is surprised and flabbergasted by this sudden turn of events and wondering what the heck Zorian did, said mageling himself rushes off out of the fray so he can pull out his telepathic relay and get in contact with the Aranea to see how the red robe ambush is going. And everything was going perfectly. The outer perimeter was sacrificed so the third time traveler wouldn't suspect a thing. He walked right into the rock liquefier trap, but everything starts to go askew from there. For one, the sedatives were having zero effect. For another, Red Robe was using a strange single target purple beam that was slow to cast. To its credit, anyone hit would immediately die. One of the mercenaries finally eats one and spooks the rest of them to unleash a barrage. Sphere of Resolve is worried that he had been killed wasting all of their effort, except it was worse. Oh, no, he didn't survive. 
but that was because he was a simulacrum. An ectoplasmic shell infused with magic. They weren't fighting the real time traveler. And then a cone of purple light washes over the room, wiping out droves of humans and Aranea. The matriarch's mind snaps the connection, and Zorian finds himself back in his own body. He immediately beelines for the Aranean settlement, but he is far too late. Scattered are bodies, human and spider, motionless. Begin searching for the male Aranea, like how Sphere of Resolve had mentioned. Zorian is disturbed at how thorough Red Roy was in wiping out the RNA. He even slashed through a children's crash. Take Zorian a while to find enough fragments to piece together the message, and it seems there are actually two parts. One is a map of the Sayorian underworld with several areas marked as important. This seemed to be Spear of Resolve's priority, as there were excessive duplicates of this map for Zorian to find. The second was a message. Although because of Red Robe's thoroughness, there's still some gaps in both. But out of the message, he's still able to make out. The mean things went awry. I know you think I had it coming by rushing into this, but simple. The time loop is degrading. I can't tell how long it will be before you can't leave any time. Thus, stopping him was can only ever be one winner in this game. I am truly hope it won't be necessary. But just in case, I'll put a map to a whole other continent. I didn't think it was possible, even with the help of... Before he can really contemplate the message he's able to understand, everything goes dark with the end of the time loop. Zorian wakes up and immediately hugs his emotional support sister. He brushes off her concern, just saying it was a nightmare he had. Once she leaves his room, he mentally apologizes for the stress he's about to cause his family, because he needs to warn the Aranea now. He teleports straight to Sayoria, as the Aranea have rather extensive anti-teleportation wards around their settlement. Before he charges in though, he makes a quick stop to ensure he is safe in case he runs into the third time traveler. Besides, he has time while his mana regenerates from the teleport. Because he's in a time crunch, he can't really take the time to painstakingly craft weapons himself. And a Zayfresh Mageling he doesn't exactly have access to deadly spell rods. He voices his frustration, and one of the nearby merchants elucidates that you know, the spell rods are pretty tightly regulated by the Mage Guild, but Zorian is open to something a bit more unorthodox. He shows a box to Zorian. After careful consideration, Zorian purchases it. Hmm, what's in the box? We jump to Zorian arriving to the settlement, and he is already uneasy. None of the patrols have intercepted him. No one answered his telepathic calls. He finally comes across an Aranea, dead. Both of them just slumped over, dead, with no signs of damage or magical residue. Everywhere he went was silence. A field of unmoving chitin, glassing eyes staring at nothing. Nothing looking like they had been fighting, just as if they dropped dead where they stood. Even more eerie, he doesn't find all the Aranea dead. He finds a couple of the males. In fact, a lot of the males he finds are ones whose mind he remembers delving last restart when he retrieved the Matriarch's message. Zorian is trying to grapple with the situation when a sizzling sound of a portal opening near him occurs. A man in a familiar red robe steps out. They stare at each other for a few seconds before the road person unleashes a barrage of magic missiles and Zorian bolts. Unfortunately, he doesn't get far. Red Robe monologues while searching for Zorian, who has wedged himself into a crack in the wall, furiously thinking of a way to shake his pursuer. A 
Apparently, Zorian is already leagues above Zack, as after decades, Zack still does not shield against the most basic of locator spells. And Soul Perception. Zorian did not skimp on his defenses and hiding spells before venturing into the dungeon. Redrobe claims the Aranea are permanently dead. The spell in the last loop removed their soul. No matter how many loops happen, they will not return to life. This stirs up a storm of emotions that Zorian quickly compartmentalizes and shoves down. Now is not the time to deal with guilt and self recriminations Amidst the chatter, Zorian learns why Red Robe hasn't just blasted Zorian and be done with it. It seems he is worried that the Aranea had brought in more people into the time loop and wants Zorian to tell him. Alas, the hide and seek has come to an end. As Zorian is yanked out of his hidey hole. Unfortunately for Red Robe, Zorian actually has formidable mind magic skills. Red Robe is a rank amateur. Seizing on the connection that Red Robe tries to establish, Zorian blasts his mind with psychic noise and starts trying to manipulate his body to get him to let go or injure himself. Unfortunately, he is not that much of a master and can't completely overpower Red Robe's body with his mind. And he knows as soon as he releases his hold on the mind link, Red Robe is going to lay smack down on him in the physical world. Which is why Zorian pulls out the revolver he bought and unloads into Red Robe at point blank. That's right, the box contained a fucking gun. Red Robe is not only stunned by being wounded, but at Zorian's temerity. What kind of mage uses a gun? Zorian is already racing down the tunnels once again. He contemplates using his self-destruct bomb, but with Red Robe having soul sight and thus likely a necromancer, destroying his body and leaving his soul floating around for capture to someone who can permanently obliviate them doesn't seem like a smart move. But he needs to render himself unrecoverable by Red Robe. He finds a bit of a breather and consults the map he memorized from the Matriarch's messages for what he needs. Hmm. A tunnel with a steep vertical drop into a massive lake marked dangerous. Yeah, I think I think that'll do. As Red Robe catches up to Zorian and unleashes lightning to stun him, it is too late. Zorian has begun stepping into the maw of the void and his inertia finishes the job. The last thing Zorian thinks is activating the bomb in his pocket before hitting the water. And his world ends in light and pain. And this concludes the first book of Mother of Learning. Now, there's something about these chapters, if you're only going along with these, these recaps and discussions, um, if you're not reading them yourself, you wouldn't know, um, is all of them have titles. Um, I've seen a lot of web serials. They've done a trick where they'll have titles for individual chapters, and they might have like an arc that'll have a a title for all of it, you know, something either, you know, as a joke or as a theme or something like that. And it's a little hard in Mother of Learning sometimes to really talk about the titles because they can be either spoilery or a little bit of a, a reference that might just take a while to understand. The title of this chapter is Soul Kill. And I think every time I get to this chapter, it always brings tears to my eyes because we've spent so much time with these Aranea, you know, the Spear of Resolve, you know, she's a bit bossy, a bit imperious, um, you know, she kind of keeps her own counsel, but she is still helpful and a friend of a kind to Zorian, you know, Enthusiastic Seeker of Novelty is very like Kiriel, you know, very energetic, exuberant, 
Um, she's curious, you know, she just wants to learn things. And having these characters pulled away from us is just a gut punch. It really sets the stakes uh, for the end of this book and really open things up for where they might go from here. Now, Zorian has spent effectively two years in the time loop so far, which is basically about the age he would have finished the academy and graduated. So I think I'm pretty, I don't think it's too much of a spoiler to say uh, the magical school arc of this story is going to be coming to a close for the time being. We'll have to see what Zorian's plans are next, because despite everything he's learned, all the skills he's accumulated, back to zero. His friends, the Aranea, gone. All his plans to out the third time looper, up in dust. What is he going to do now? How is he going to get one over on someone who has years or decades more experience in the time loop than him? Is he going to be hunted by the red robe? Is he going to have to evade him? Hmm. We'll just have to continue reading and find out. I will say, though, we are going to be taking a bit of a longer break before starting in to the second book. Um, so... Uh, there's a couple technical things I want to put together, but whenever we go back into it, I will certainly put up awareness in the socials, you know, the, uh, the Twitter, the blue skies, um, and it will be, it'll be, it'll likely, we'll still be doing, you know, every other week. Um, I feel like that's been a pretty good pace. Um, but yeah, thank you for, um, vibing. Thank you for listening. Thank you for stopping on by as we go through this story that I think is a very great web serial that is not as well known as I think it should be.